So this is a picture of Abby Wambach, the ominous female soccer player, the National League. Just after she performed one of her headers that this time around provoked a concussion. She stated, I'm okay, which provoked that the referee did not call medical uh, team onto the field. And she continued to play and ended up having prolonged symptoms after this event, probably cumulative also for all other headers she did, but this was one that was a very, provoked a very serious concussion. Similarly, Kramer, Christopher Kramer, who played in the national, um, in the um, World Cup final uh, last year in uh, Brazil, and you might be, some of you might be familiar with that story. He had a very bad collision and was actually taken out for a brief medical assessment and was returned right away back to the field. Until about 10, 15 minutes later, he went to the referee and asked the referee, is this the final of the World Cup? And the referee couldn't believe his question and said, um, are you asking me, is this the final? And he said, yes. And the referee answered, yes, it is. And Christopher Kramer turned around and said, thank you, it's helpful to know. This best describes what happens after a concussion. It's a very elusive injury. It's a very invisible injury. If Christopher Kramer had a knee injury and torn a ligament, he would have been out of the game, no question. He would have been escorted, never returned to that game. But the concussion, even being touching an organ that's very complex, but also has an incredible resilience and capacity to regenerate or to cover up, actually, in the moment when it's injured, <clears throat> poses a lot of very uh, difficult questions and how to handle it, how to recognize it, how to manage it. Okay. So what, how does a concussion happen? What is it due to? What is the mechanism? It's a direct blow to the head, neck, or face. And that can happen in a game, obviously it happens very often in the athletic scene, um, or it can also happen just during any injury, fall, etc. It's a physical force, typically, in sports again. Um, it can be more of linear nature, it can be of rotational nature. The rotational nature is usually has more severe injury as a consequence. And in the military <laughs> set setting, it can be due to a shock wave which typically happens in the situation of an IED, an improvised explosive device, emitting shock waves, and it, it provokes the same type of very similar type of injury, similarly invisible. Many times they don't realize that they're actually being injured because there's not a direct impact. So it's even more difficult to capture and for the individual even to realize. And then obviously the civilian population due to a fall or a car accident, so concussions occur. And so very different, varied settings. What happens to your brain after, during a concussion? So there is the result of these forces is a very complex pathophysiological process. It can be more of biochemical nature. A lot of the bio, uh, neurotransmitters are jumbled up, they do uh, immediately react to you know, the physical forces. It can also be, uh, it, basically what it creates is, is it's an injury-induced vulnerability of the brain. The brain is in a very vulnerable stage after you know, it sustains a concussion. And it also there is an increase in uh, a glucose demand because of the brain trying to react to this impact. It needs more fuel and therefore uh, uh, has an increased demand on the body for glucose, which then it doesn't always get, and that in itself creates damage in the brain. And there is also reduction, and this has been shown in a couple of studies, of reduced blood flow. It's an imaging technology that can measure so-called so arterial spin labeling that can measure the blood flow to the brain. And that one is clearly reduced in case of a concussion. And again, as you can imagine, the oxygen supply is not as it should be. What are the early signs of concussion? They're very complex and can be of very varied nature. To mention the most prevalent ones, it's usually that altered state of consciousness, as is best described in this case by Christopher Kramer. 
they're kind of out of it. They might not remember what just happened before in the game. They might not remember what happened before in that day. They're temporarily disoriented in space and time. That is the very typical. Injury doesn't have to occur, but it's many times the case. Again, quite invisible and elusive, and players can cover it up momentarily. They're actually on a cruise control, and it's like an airplane that's cruising. The athlete is cruising in the field, but the pilot is not there. That is sort of the best way I can describe it. Uh, besides that more sort of um, graspable symptoms are dizziness, balance problems. They can have um, uh, nausea. Uh, vision, uh, tr uh, troubles with visual processing, double vision, or uh, light immediate light sensitivity. Um, there can be the memory issues, as I mentioned, and um, feeling out of it, not feeling themselves, balance problems um, that are, again, a little bit more visible, etc. What are the long-term signs of concussion or prolonged symptoms. So 80% of concussed individuals recover spontaneously within two weeks, seemingly. Okay, We'll go into that a little bit later. 20% um, have prolonged symptoms. And these prolonged symptoms are usually working memory issues. They many times have troubles with sort of mild, you know, um, memorization of, for instance, where did I just leave my car keys and, you know, don't know in which room they left them. Obviously, which in a, for a student who is, should be learning, there can be learning issues. Many times prolonged visual uh, light sensitivity issues. They're very sensitive to screens, very difficult to work with computers. Auditory hypersensitivity of, to noise and uh, processing speed. They're very, many times their processing speed is decreased, troubles with concentration. So as you can imagine, can be quite hampering for many everyday activities. So what do we really, really want to avoid is the second impact before the brain really recovered. And that's the biggest challenge for anyone involved in managing concussions. What happens during a so-called second impact uh, syndrome is there is a disruption of the cerebrovascular autoregulation. So the small arterioles in the brain do not adapt to the demands of blood flow in the brain. They stay dilated, which then can very easily go into a brain edema. And if that's the case, it is really a catastrophic brain edema that can end very dramatically or if the person survives, then usually they're quite injured. So that is the second impact if a concussion occurs within days or weeks after a first concussion had occurred. And that is something that uh, we definitely want to avoid. What can be the long-term effects is so-called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, commonly now called CTE. And historically, this really started with the height of boxing, where the diagnosis of dementia puglistica was established. And basically what it means, and uh, it's now called more chronic, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, more recently has been identified on football players. But what both of them mean is that there are tau deposits in the brain tissue. So what happens, during, and this really has been identified in professional players, which I really would like to emphasize, um, in professional football players and earlier in the boxers, which obviously there's a very high incidence of these repetitive blows to the head. The cytoskeleton of the neuron disintegrates and tau proteins goes out into the tissue and then creates obstacles for brain signals, whether they're chemical or um, electrical nature, basically the two modes of signal processing that go on normally in the brain, and these tau deposits get into the way. So this is when we then face later on in life, or these individuals face neurodegenerative diseases as Muhammad Ali, who suffers now from Parkinson's disease and dementia. And in the football players, mainly 
these brains that have been going to Boston, to the brain bank, have been um, identified and uh, as um, being the deposits in the prefrontal lobe and also in the medial temporal lobe where memory sits in the brain. So they suffer from dementia. All of these players whose brains post-mortem went to Boston um, had actually a history of dementia. Most, a lot of them committed suicide and related to depression. So this is a diagnosis that can unfortunately right now only be identified after death and in the, uh, to a neuropathologist. So how many blows are too many? Can we come up with a way of identifying this earlier? This is something where a lot of research efforts are going on right now because we would like to capture this early. That would definitely be a moment when an athlete or anyone who sustains repetitive blows or in the military setting, you would want to take them out of that activity. How do we study concussion? Here is an example of a study that we did in our lab, and we chose a working memory task. And basically what it, as you can see in the top row, you have the so-called uh, one, back, one back task. It's called an N back task uh, because you can go ask them to remember one letter back or two letter back or three letter back. So these images, these slides were processed into the scanner uh, for five, shown for 500 milliseconds and then a 700 millisecond interval and then another slide and the individual had to identify whether it just saw the, in the previous slide the same letter in the same location on the circle. It could be up, down, left, right, or um, yeah, the four locations. The two-back task, which is the one that we then actually ended up analyzing because it was kind of the sweet spot where it was hard enough for them to do, but they could do it is when the letter is two slides back and they had to identify the regardless of case. And as you can see where the arrows are, that's the correct solution for the two back. And then we had a three back task, three letters back, but that task was very difficult. I had a hard time to do it, most students, and even the normal control, non-concast subjects had a hard time to do. So we uh, tested 15 subjects in each group, uh, 15, uh, high-risk contact sports, athletes, football, ice hockey, a variety of contact sports. And the control group were normal control subjects, swimmers, row rowers, tennis players, who had no history of concussion. And both groups performed the task. We recorded the brain activation and the top row of brain images, and it's in three dimensions, so there's an axial slice and then a sagittal slice side view and then the front or back view wherever you want to look at it very to the right the first row is two days then the middle row is two weeks and the last row is two months the red clusters represent the areas of the brain in which the concussed subjects hyperactivated. So they had significant more activation in those areas as, the normal con as compared to the normal control subjects. These are areas of, a, of the brain that were identified in the normal population as the typical areas that subserved this kind of task. So we knew that and we chose that because we didn't want to confound finding out where does this occur in a, in a brain that had sustained a concussion. So when you look at the cluster to the left, and then maybe you want to look at this, uh, the axial slice, the first slice to the left, it's, in, it's always reversed, so it's in the left hemisphere where language occurs. These were all right-handers, we kept that constant. So that cluster is probably the most representative. The other areas were kind of supporting areas that on top of the primary area that subserves the task, they had to pull in in order to perform on the same level. And behaviorally, on the behavioral data, they performed, there was no difference between the normal, no significant difference between the normal controls and the concussed individuals. So they could perform the task at the same level as the normal subjects, but had to activate the brain infinitely higher, or high, have to have higher activation in the relevant areas. So as you can see, that persisted at two weeks and at two months. So what we then did is we took the average of all those little voxels that were part of the clusters, of the cluster in the left hemisphere, the one that 
typically subserves that task, averaged it for each subject, and then plotted it on this graph. So to the left, you have two days post-injury, and then the middle dots, that vertical, uh, is two weeks, and then at the very end to the right is two months. And each circle represents one individual subject. So the lines above the blue line, which represents the activation of the normal control subject. So we did also three time points to show that there's no, and make sure that there was no um, difference in activation in the normal control subject. So as you can see, they're pretty constant. Just a little fluctuation. And then you see that all the other ones are clearly above, and there's a high variability. And the variability actually increases at two weeks. And the interesting thing is that all, all athletes were asymptomatic, no more symptoms around two weeks, some a little earlier, some a little later, in that, in that area, in that sort of time frame. And also tested neuropsychologically back to their baseline. All athletes now in every university, even in high school, at least in New Jersey, maybe not in all states, but here, are, it's mandatory that they take neuropsychological testing, the impact testing, so that it, in the case of a concussion, it can be served as their baseline. So they were back to baseline, and all of them returned to play. But the brain measures, the way the brain handled this task, this working memory task, they were still not functioning within the normal range, right? All the red lines are, are above the normal controls and even at two months. So what we don't know is for how long might they have been compensating. And this is where it, we need to make a huge effort in research-wise in coming up with a measure that actually is more objective than the behavior. The injury is mild enough that they can compensate, but really the brain is not back to normal. So there is no brain triple bypass. If we get a second impact syndrome, there is no bypass or no, no measure we can really take, uh, so we want to avoid it. I think this is a really the big message. And concussion is a public health issue. It happens everywhere, and, but it's something we need to uncover. Neural recovery lags behind behaviorally assessed recovery, as we could see in that study. They are not fully recovered on a brain level, a neural level, but behaviorally, they behave normally or they have no more symptoms. Nothing is telling them something is wrong. Again, this is this resilience in the brain that we need to take into account. And finally, prevention is the only cure for brain injury. Thank you.